welcome to Brain Chat. I'm Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, your board certified neurologist and MS specialist. And my mission is to engage, educate, and empower those affected by MS to become an active part of their healthcare team. Here on Brain Chat, we'll be discussing all things MS, health and wellness, advocacy, and we'll even throw a little bit of music and music therapy in there as well. Thank you so much for joining us and stay tuned for the next episode. Happy Monday and welcome to Brain Chat, everyone. I'm Dr. Mitzi, the nerdy neurologist, and I am super excited to be here to talk about NMOSD awareness. Um, so this month is Multiple Sclerosis Awareness Month as well as NMOSD Awareness Month. And listen, I have got two superstars here for today's episode, and I am so excited. For those of you who are new to Brain Chat, whenever you log in, please feel free to drop in the chat where you are viewing us from. I bid you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, where it is the first day of spring and it's 26 degrees, which is cold for us Georgians down here. So we've got our, you know, big coats and hats and fur and all that other stuff out because we're not used to these types of temperatures. Um, but anyway, um, let's get into this program. So I'm going to introduce my two guests. Um, I have Samira Ahmed and Christine Ha with me tonight. And listen, I am so excited because I have the dream team, two amazing advocates here to talk about their experience as well as some of the amazing things that are going on in the NMOSD space. So we'll get started with Samira. She is the founder and executive director of the Samira Foundation. And prior to her career in healthcare and hospital administration in Boston, she was an actress, model, and professionally trained dancer. We're going to have to learn a little bit more about that, Samira. And she's performed in venues around the world, including Madison Square Garden, the Dolby Theater. And once she was diagnosed with NMOSD in 2014, within two months, she started the Samira Foundation. And she's dedicated to raising global awareness about NMOSD and MOGAD and creating communities of support and advocating on behalf of patients and caregivers and supporting clinical research. Research. She has got the whole the whole package here. In 2015, she was crowned Miss Bangladesh USA, advocating for equal opportunity education for Bangladeshi children in efforts to increase tolerance and strengthen the country's internal presence. And also in 2021, she was honored with the WeGo Health's Best Kept Secret Award for her advocacy work. And I have Christine Ha, who is a renowned restaurateur, entrepreneur author living with NMOSD. Um, and she was diagnosed in 2003 at the age of 23. And by the age of 28, she'd nearly lost all of her vision. Um, she's authored a New York Times bestselling cookbook, Recipes from My Home Kitchen. She's opened three restaurants in Houston, hosted a cooking show for the visually impaired, as well as served as culinary envoy on behalf of the American embassy and travels the world giving TEDx talks. And listen, I follow her on social media and every time I see posts from her restaurants, I get hungry and wish I could just teleport myself down to Houston to get myself some good food. <laughs> Welcome ladies to Brain Chat. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Absolutely. Listen, we are going to have so much fun. I have so been looking forward to chatting with both of you um, tonight on Brain Chat. Um, so thank you guys so much for taking time out on your Monday night to spend some time with us and with our viewers to tell us a little bit about your journey with NMOSD. So before, before we kind of get into some of the formal questions, I always ask everybody, tell us a little bit about yourself. So we'll start with Samira. So we heard a little bit about your bio, but tell us a little bit about your journey when you were diagnosed um, with NMOSD and kind of how you got to where you are now. Sure. And, and also, I just want to say thank you for having me on your show. I am equally as excited. I've been looking forward to this and I can't think of a better way to spend my Monday night alongside you. And of course, Christine Ha, I am a big fangirl of the both of you. And to be in this platform with two powerhouse women uh, is really such an honor for me. So thank you. Um, okay, my NMO diagnosis. Yikes. Uh, <clears throat> nine years ago. Nine years ago, I was 25 years old, naive, um, feeling like I was on top of the world, like any young 25-year-old 
person living in the city with no health problems feels. And uh, yeah, I suddenly uh, lost my vision almost overnight and feeling in parts of my body. And, you know, to make a long story short, thankfully, I was working in healthcare here in Boston at the time. And within six weeks, I was diagnosed with NMOSD. Um, at the time, it was only NMO. Spectrum disorder came later. Right. And uh, my first question to the doctor, as soon as I heard this very long diagnosis name was, am I going to die? And mm. yeah, that's, I mean, I mean, I vividly remember the first time I ever heard neuromyelitis optica. It jolted my entire being. I can imagine. And what about you, Christine? Well, I was diagnosed very early on when it was still called Devitt's disease. And mm -hmm. it was considered a rare orphan disease. No one really knew what it was. Even my neurologist had not heard much about it. Many of my doctors didn't know what NMO was. Um, I was initially misdiagnosed with MS and it took I think about four years before they correctly diagnosed me with NMOSD. So for me, it manifested first as optic neuritis and then some paralysis. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold. <coughs> um, and so I had the whole gamut of like the spinal cord inflammation, the optic nerve mm -hmm. inflammation. Um, and it was definitely tough because I didn't know anyone with the disease back then. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. And so, you know, you guys have also uh, inadvertently just given us a history lesson, right, in kind of the evolution of NMOSD. So back in the Stone Ages, when I was in training, it was considered a part or subtype of multiple sclerosis. Um, and we used to call it, you know, DeVick's disease, but it was considered a part of MS. And then in the early 2000s, there was a development of more science to help us understand that there was a separate target for NMOSD, that there was an antibody that we could check um, and that target was identified. And, you know, by the early tw 2010s, I guess that's a thing, 20 teens, um, we had an antibody that could identify DeVix or NMOSD as a separate disease from multiple sclerosis. But a large percentage of people were initially misdiagnosed and still may be misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis when actually they have NMOSD. So we talk about the symptoms. You guys describe some of the symptoms that you had, but some of the most common ones are visual problems like you had, Christine, um, spinal cord issues as well. Um, what specific symptoms? So Samira, you said you had numbness. What other symptoms did you had or have you had? Well, like Christine, it had just started with the optic neuritis. And I don't mean to mm -hmm. say just to minimize it, but that was the right. only thing that had happened. And then right. over a period of six weeks, I started to feel the nausea and the crazy amount of like pain in my eyes behind my neck. And, you know, if you had cut my body in half, the entire left side of my body, parts of it was either numb or it felt like it was on fire. Mm -hmm. Um of course, you know, over the years, symptoms have just kept coming and coming. So it's like every year I get a nice little surprise, like, okay, what's new? What else is coming? Mm -hmm. away? But yeah, it's, uh, it's challenging too, because, and I'm sure Christine can relate, like from the outside, people can't really tell that this is going on inside of your body. And I would say that especially as women, we always go above and beyond to make sure that no one's really worrying about us, that we're okay. So for even now, I feel like people, when they look at me and I tell them I have NMO and I have vision loss and I have this and I have that, they're like, what are you talking about? You look fine. Uh-huh. Have you had that experience? So I hear that a lot as well from all of my patients, from my MS patients, as well as my NMO SD patients, you know, but you don't look sick, but you look so good, you know, um, you know, do you experience that as well, Christine? I do. I think something I get a lot too is, is you look so normal. <laughs> and I find that kind of offensive because what does normal it is mean kind in of these offensive. days, right? <laughs> yeah, but I, I get that all the time. People are like, but you don't look blind. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Am I supposed to be wearing dark sunglasses all the time? Right. Um, so it, it is, I find, a difficult disease to uh, express or to relate to people about because mm -hmm. I guess people are expecting you to be physically in a wheelchair and I'm not always using my my white cane or all, you know, I'm not 
in a space where if I'm in a space where I know well, like my restaurant, I don't necessarily always have to use my cane or a sighted guide. So I think it does confuse people. And, and of course, like a lot of the neuropathic pain or the neurological issues, you can't physically tell externally. So that's also mm -hmm. hard to explain like, oh, I can't move my, you know, my arm or like my back really hurts. And that I find it difficult to explain a lot of the symptoms of NMO SD. Yeah. And so when we talk about raising awareness, right? So, you know, it is definitely still considered a rare disease, not quite as rare as when you were diagnosed, Christine. Um, but when we talk about diagnosis, we touched on this a little bit, how people can be misdiagnosed with MS. So I want to make sure we know a little bit about the differences between NMOSD and MS. The symptoms can often be very similar, right? So people have optic neuritis. Optic neuritis can happen with MS, but also can happen with NMOSD. The difference is oftentimes the optic neuritis may be more severe in NMOSD and people may not recover as well from vision loss. Whereas with MS, sometimes in the beginning, people will recover completely completely if they have an optic neuritis. And then there also is spinal cord involvement, what you, which you both have alluded to, whether it's due to numbness and tingling or weakness or pain. Um, but there's not as much involvement in the brain with NMOSD as there is with MS. So there can be brain involvement. And really, our understanding has evolved over time, because back in the day, we used to say, if you had any spots in your brain, it wasn't NMOSD, it was MS. But now we realize that's not true. So you can have spots in your brain with NMOSD, but they're not the typical ones that we see with MS. Sometimes they look a little bit different. Sometimes they may be larger, or there's certain areas that may be involved, such as the one that causes you to have nausea and vomiting, um, you know, as you said, Samira. So those are some of the, the, dif the differences. And there is a blood test that we can do to test for NMOSD where we don't have one for MS. So let me ask you, Christine. So you said you have been mis you have been misdiagnosed with MS. So what caused the shift to have your doctors maybe suggest that maybe this is NMOSD and not multiple sclerosis? Or what caused that change in thought process? Uh, I was put on a lot of MS therapy and none of them worked for me. So I had your daily injections, then I had uh, IVIG and none of it was really working. And I continued to worsen and have mm -hmm. multiple attacks every year. And then it was the year that the, the, the biomarker and the antibody test did come out. And so that's when my neurologist decided to send my blood in to get a test. And I, I did have, and I was NMO positive. Okay, gotcha. And what about you, Samara? What made them, did they think NMOSD off the bat or were you also kind of thought to possibly have MS as well? Yeah, so my first attack, um, I was told that it was an idiopathic case of optic neuritis, mm. that uh, my vision would return within three months to a year, and that at that point, I had a 16% chance of developing MS at some point in my life. But when I was discharged, they were basically like, listen, it's probably never going to happen again. We don't know why it happened, but the best thing we can advise is take some vitamin D supplements. You're severely vitamin D deficient, which I now know was a hint. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of move on with your life. Mm -hmm. And then four weeks later, when I had my technically my first relapse and the vision loss spread to both my eyes, the acuity was affected, and then the body symptoms started happening. That's when they said, okay, we think this is NMO. And I do think it's worth noting, especially for the audience, um, the patients who are, who are listening to this and watching this, I am one of the not so few patients who are still double zero negative. So mm -hmm. I did not test positive for aquaporin four or the MOGAD antibody. And um, I think there's a lot of us out there and it's tough because, you know, on the one hand, you're like, okay, maybe then it's nothing. Right. But then like clearly is something, but right. what is it? Are we going to test positive for something eventually in our lives? Or is there an antibody that has yet to be discovered? On paper, I'm considered to have seronegative neuromyelitis optica. But I have to say, you know, from um, an identity perspective and being mm -hmm. able to relate to something, it's very challenging. But mm -hmm. furthermore, getting access to therapies is in incredibly challenging. Right. 
Right. Um, so many good things that you said there. Um, you know, so when we talk about the test, so there is the aquaporin 4 antibody, which is considered the NMO um, antibody also, but there's also a newer disease that we've learned about, um, myelin oligodendrocyte. <laughs> um, so the MOGAD, right, um, which is similar to NMO SD, but a little bit different. So there are antibodies for both of those diseases, not for MS. And oftentimes if we test for one, we test for both of them. But with this um, advent of what we call NMO spectrum disorder, so NMOSD is spectrum disorder, meaning some people have the vision problem, some people have the spinal cord problem, some people have both, you know, um, some people have the antibody, a majority of people do, but some people don't, right? So again, as our tests become more specific, Hopefully we're able to pick up more people who may have previously been negative for those antibodies, but it still is a clinical diagnosis, right? So the antibody test helps us, um, but it still is a clinical diagnosis, whether someone fits more in a NMOSD category or a MOGAD category, or if they fit more in an MS category. Um, and so another thing I'd really like to hear your thoughts about are um, the advent of newer treatments. So as you mentioned, Samira, um, when we think about some of the treatments, there are now treatments for NMOSD and there weren't specific treatments even as of like five years ago. So this is a really, really new, um, you know, uh, thing, but you have to be uh, positive for the antibody to get treatment. So what are your, what were your guys' thoughts when the first treatments became available like you know so i know as a neurologist we were really excited we were treating the best we could but this is this was a really kind of landmark breakthrough to have actual medicines fda approved for um nmosd so what are you guys thoughts about that i think for me it's great i think there's a lot of breakthrough research and stuff being done in this nmosd field i think for one i remember going through the experience of trying to get treatment covered by insurance was really difficult because back when I was initially diagnosed, there, there were no therapies or treatments specifically for NMO. And so I had to receive treatments that were not FDA approved. And I think that posed a large uh, challenge with my insurance company. So I had to jump through a lot of hoops and, and all of these things to even get it covered uh, partially. So I think knowing that the field is growing and the, the research is growing and that therapies are now being developed specifically for NMOSD, I think is, is great. I mean, of course, ideally we would want a cure, right? But right. I think having treatment plans that work and that are specific about this and, and that helps also just raise, I think, the awareness about the disease. And I think that's helpful for so many people. What are your thoughts, Amara? I will never, ever, ever forget the day that I read the press release about that about the first FDA approved therapy. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just moved to tears, very, very, very happy tears, because, you know, for so long, we lived in isolation and mm -hmm. um, no, no therapies for us, you know, obviously no cure in sight. And so little was being said about it. And when I heard about the first FDA approved therapy, I was so moved because my, I, I just thought to myself, like, oh, my God, people care. People care. Mm. People are listening. They, they, we're not going to be alone in this. And then two more came out the next year. And yeah. similarly, I was just filled with so much hope because not only were there multiple, you know, companies now thinking about us. And, and I, I know how, you know, it takes a village to make these therapies. Mm get to the finish line. So I think about how many thousands of people were involved in getting therapies for NMOSD approved into the market. Yeah. And on top of that, these patients who have been living in, you know, suffering and silence and darkness, literally, um, now had options for therapy, having a choice. Yeah. You know, it's no, it's no longer a situation where the doctor's like, okay, well, I think this might work. It's kind of worked for everyone before. So we'll see what happens. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, uh, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge uh -huh. there. No, now it's a different story. Now you're like, okay, of course we have these therapies that we have used for since the beginning of time to treat this. But now we have three therapies you can choose from that are right. for 
our disease and that have very high efficacy rates. So for me, I think it's a gift and it's like a dream come true for NMOSD patients. Yeah, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Your life's easier. Yeah. I mean, and it makes our lives e definitely. Yes. <laughs> definitely. Um, you know, because doctors, we like to see the data. So, mm -hmm. you know, so mm -hmm. of course we have our clinical experience of what we've been doing for, you know, 15, 20 years. But certainly, you know, um, one of the reasons I went into neuroimmunology is because I felt like it was the cutting edge of medicine. Like I had hope that there would be so much advancement that the way that I was treating people when I first started would be nothing like I was treating people, you know, 10 or 20 years from when I started practicing. And that really has come to fruition. And it's been very, very exciting to be able to offer, you know, specific treatments to my patients. Like this is really like, I know I'm probably not expressing how excited I am, but it's really <laughs> exciting. Um, so, Let's talk about, let's shift gears a little bit and let's kind of get broader. And let's talk about why is it important to raise awareness about NMOSD, right? Um, it's a rare disease, right? And some are like, well, there aren't that many people affected by it. Why is it so important for us to be raising awareness about um, this condition and letting people know that if they're having certain symptoms, they need to get evaluated or they need to get tested? Um, tell us your thoughts about that. I'll start with Christine. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I think that my particular story talks about is, is a testament to why it's important because I was initially misdiagnosed. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's many, there are many patients out there who likely have the same story where they were misdiagnosed. And then they may go through the same process as, as me where the challenge was finding the right treatment and getting worse. And that I feel like if I had been correctly diagnosed and then put on the proper treatment earlier on, I could have salvaged my vision, for example. So I think it's just really important to continue to raise awareness about this rare disease, because perhaps it's not as rare as we thought it was. And I think also just knowing that NMOSD affects a lot of more Asian women and African American mm -hmm. women than, you know, we think. So I think that's also important to, to remember that as well as there can be such a thing as misdiagnoses. And so it's important to raise awareness about even rare diseases, because like I said, it may not be as rare as we thought. Absolutely. What about you, Samara? Well, I think that the simple concept of knowing results in so many different things that very positively benefit this community. So for one, heightened awareness will lead to more fundraising, which is what drives science and science is what makes us better. And then if we're alive longer, we can have community and great lives and, and then advocate for those who don't aren't as fortunate. So I think that everything kind of stems from awareness when it comes to NMOSD, MOGAD, MS, and uh, just rare disease in general. If you don't know about these diseases, mm -hmm. you will not support them, whether it's by donating or, you know, listening to a story or helping a friend who's telling you, hey, I have these symptoms, you know, maybe, you know, it's being able to help somebody out. So I think awareness is a, one of the core pillars of this quest to finding a cure for NMOSD and MOGAD. Absolutely. And, you know, in my opinion, if we reach one person and make a difference for one person, then mm -hmm. all the awareness is totally worth it. And I, I think the other piece that's extremely important is that we think about what's at stake right? You know, so with diseases like hypertension, diabetes, it certainly is important to raise awareness. Um, sometimes if your sugar is a little bit elevated for a while, we can, we can potentially fix that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but with NMOSD and demyelinating disease, it's your brain. It's your brain and your vision that's at stake, right? So the stakes are really high. We need to make sure that people are aware so they can get early diagnosis and so that they can be treated appropriately. Um, and as a physician, sometimes it can can be really disheartening how many symptoms people kind of blow off, you know, like I've had people come mm -hmm. in and say, well, my vision went out for like a month and it came back. And I'm like, you didn't go back to the doctor. <laughs> like that's not normal, you know? And so, you know, particularly as young people, you know, yeah. which I'm not as young uh, as, you know, you guys were, when you di were diagnosed, but particularly as young people, sometimes people will just say, well, well, that's just, I'm just getting old. And I'm like, well, you're 20 
and you shouldn't be having that. That's not old, you know? And so I think it's really important for everyone to pay attention to their bodies. And if they're having neurologic symptoms to get that checked out, regardless as to how young you are, because both of you were diagnosed in your twenties. So very young, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so I think it's extremely important for us to raise awareness so people can, you know, make sure they're paying attention and, and getting checked out. So, in the line of raising awareness, tell us a little bit. I mean, you guys, so we've talked about diagnosis. We've talked about some therapies, but you guys are doing some really exciting things in the NMOSD space. And I want to hear a little bit more about some of the work that you're doing. Um, there is the um, there is a campaign um, that you all are involved in, the NMOSD Won't Stop Me campaign. Um, tell us about tell us about some of the work that's going on. Tell us what you're excited about, um, particularly during this NMOSD Awareness Month. If there are any events that you're involved in or any work that you're doing in general that um, that you'd like to share and talk about. Smart, you want to go first? Sure. Um, well, this is technically my eighth NMO Awareness Month. And what I can share from my vantage point is that year over year, it gets bigger and bigger and better and better. So really cool to observe that. There are so many different things happening virtually, in person, community-oriented, science-oriented, education-oriented. It's just so wonderful to have... Um, there's like a choose your adventure. There's something for everybody. And what I'm particularly excited about um, this year is really seeing how this community is not just doing their part in raising awareness, but how many more people are embracing that they have NMO. It's no longer something that they're keeping a secret. It's like kind of a badge of honor in a way. So I, I really love to see that. And I think, you know, doing more of these types of campaigns like NMOSD won't stop me. We're having our Dallas patient day with Christine next Saturday. You know, we're doing all these online campaigns, social media, this and that. It's, it's, it's really giving hope to, to those patients who are at home still in denial, still upset and still wondering what's going to come of their lives. It, it provides so much hope and inspiration. And, you know, I hope that it makes people excited about their futures. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I want to echo like what Samara is saying. I think being a part of this year's uh, NMOSD won't stop me campaign. You know, I think Last year, Dr. Williams, you and I did the whole media tour together talking about this and continuing to raise this awareness about this rare disease. And and the things that I'm most excited about is just seeing this community grow in so many ways since like the two decades that I've been diagnosed. And this year, being able to connect in person with other patients who live with the same condition, it's it's um, hopeful, it's encouraging, and it's inspiring to see what other people have done with their lives in spite of living with NMOSD. Well said. So let's go back because you guys are not bragging on yourselves enough. So let's (laughs) go back, right? So Samira, Mm. tell us how you decided to start a foundation two months after diagnosis. What was that thought process? How, how did we do that? And tell us what your foundation, tell us about your foundation, what kind of work you're doing. Come on, get, give us the tea. We want the tea. <laughs> okay, let me spill the tea, Missy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, just I was 25 and my entire world just got turned upside down. I was starting chemotherapy. I'm being told that, you know, you have five years to live on the internet. And all I could think when I left the hospital was like, what now? What do I do now? How is there a playbook on what do I do? Because there, and there wasn't, there wasn't, that's what it was. There was not, I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know how to find another patient. So I went home and I thought to myself, okay, this, this something good has to come out of it. I'm just that type of person. I believe that. And, you know, maybe it's naive, but I really needed that. That was sort of like a, a survival tool for me at that time of crisis. And when I went home, I was in bed rest for like three weeks. And I kept looking online. I'm like, 
okay, is there a celebrity with NMO? Is there a foundation? And then I was like, how do I find another patient? How do I find out how many people have this? And for me, being a you know, social media savvy, digital, millennial, whatever you want to call me, patient at that time, I could not find what I was looking for. It just mm. didn't exist. And I was incredibly frustrated. And all I wanted was to not feel alone. Mm. So then I was like, you know what? I studied PR. I've been working in entertainment for 20 years at that point. I worked in healthcare. I knew a lot of people. I made a little vision board, taking those elements in consideration. And then I looked at the landscape of NMO from a patient's perspective. And I said, okay, research is being done. That's great. There were a couple of patient advocacy organizations that were fully research focused, but who's taking care of general public awareness and patient education? So I was like, okay, let's mix all of this together. And I Googled, how do you start a foundation? And I've said this a few times in a few interviews, but Google told me it was five easy steps. And that is absolutely <laughs> not true. <laughs> not true at all. But I'm glad Google lied to me. A little more than I, five. Well, just a little bit. But if I had known how much work it actually was, I'm not sure that I would have committed to it. But yeah, that's how I did it. And I said to myself, if it's true that I have five years to live, I've got a lot of work to do between now and then, so I'm not going to waste any time. And the next month, I announced through Boston Magazine that I was doing this. And then in October, we were recognized by the IRS as a nonprofit organization in the United States. November, wow. I launched my first website. And in December, we launched our first program, Voices of NMO, which is still in existence today. And I'm biased, but it was my, it's my favorite program. So, yeah. Wowzers. Wowzers. <laughs> yeah. So it's a little more than five steps to start a nonprofit. And um, yeah, you so know that. Obviously, yeah. So I do know that uh, from my personal experience, which is a lot uh, longer, uh, further after yours. Um, but still, I mean, what an amazing thing. You know, I always try to stress to people, you know, if there is something that doesn't exist and there's something that you see and it's a need, maybe you're the person to create or fill that space, you know, create something to fill that space. And so I really love how you just became activated. And, you know, it's also important to have a sense of community, right? And it's hard for people who live, you know, many of my patients who live with MS, and there are a million people in the US with MS. So I could even imagine for a rarer disease like NMOSD, that it sometimes is even more difficult. So tell us about the ambassadors and about the research that you do. I'm, st I'm not going to let you get away. Like you're not, you're not giving me, you, you got to give us all the stuff you're doing. I mean, you're doing some really cool stuff. And then I'm coming to you, Christine, and we're going to talk about Master Chef and all of your amazing stuff as oh well. Oh my gosh, I can't wait for that. Okay, I'm going to go quickly because I, I definitely want to hear Christine's story. But um, yeah, so, you know, we launched and uh, kind of to your point earlier, Mitzi, I said to myself, I if I can even help one person, then that's enough because that's one less person who has to go through this alone. And mm -hmm. basically over the last nine years, we've grown quite a bit and we are now, um, you know, expanding globally. Our foundation is dedicated to raising awareness of NMOSD and Mogan. We fundraise. So we have four pillars. It's awareness, community, advocacy, and research. We launched mm -hmm. a research program mm, four years ago and uh, have since funded uh, about $650,000 in projects. That's 20 <laughs> It's 25 projects, uh, both in the U.S. and abroad. And I'm hoping that after this year's gala, that we are able to break the $1 million mark. Because while there have been so many breakthroughs in research and science for neuroimmunology, there's still so much more to be learned and discovered. So I hope that we can um, do our part to be a catalyst in all of that. And our ambassadors, I mean, I think that they are the pride and joy of our foundation. You know, we're very proud to be patient-led and patient-powered, incredibly diverse. MJW, you and I have talked about this before. Uh, diversity is a superpower. Absolutely. And I look at our foundation and, and I beam with pride when I see how inclusive it's, it is yeah. and how 
anyone around the world can look at one of our ambassadors and say, hey, that person looks like me or that person speaks the same language as me or they, you know, they have a similar story or they live in a similar, you know, situation, a city, a country, whatever. But these ambassadors are so much more than just volunteers for the organization. They are uh, champions of the diseases. They are mm -hmm. examples of how you can really turn, uh, oh my God, I'm so bad with expressions. What is it? Lemonade in, from lemon. Lemons into lemonade. <laughs> yes, exactly. I don't think you can turn lemonade into anything no, else. I don't think so either. Maybe a popsicle. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe a freeze pop. Yeah, so that's so amazing. And, you know, I think the cool thing is that people can go on the website and they can identify an ambassador. They're, you know, listed by country and they tell a little bit about their story and they can be contacted, you know, so that that need to be able to find somebody with the condition that you can identify with. Um, you can find people that you can talk to that can, you know, potentially help you through that process, you know, as you're getting diagnosed or going through a difficult time. So let's talk about you, Christine. So, you know, you're you're definitely no slouch, my dear. You got a lot going on there, too. Um, let's talk about what was it like doing master? So where did you find your inspiration to start cooking? So you weren't originally a, you know, classically trained chef. So how did you now, you know, after diagnosis become this amazing, you know, restaurateur and, you know, creating all the yummy food that I see on my Instagram timeline. So <laughs> tell us about that journey. Well, interestingly enough, I, began learning how to cook the same time I was going through this whole NMOSD journey. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in college at the time. And initially I started cooking as a means of survival. Uh, I didn't know how to cook really anything going off to college. And when I went off to college and I started remembering a lot of the dishes I grew up eating. So my uh, parents were Vietnamese refugees. So I grew up eating a lot of home cooked Vietnamese food. And my mom actually died when I was young and never taught me how to cook. So when I went to college, I was very homesick and miss uh, my childhood and my youth and all the, the flavors that I grew up eating. So I decided to teach myself how to cook. So it was just at that time, I still had full vision. I would buy secondhand cookbooks and then just start experimenting in my small apartment kitchen. And then I realized that I enjoyed it because there was something very satisfying about being able to make something and feed other people with it. And I saw the joy I was able to bring to other people and, and the fact that I could satiate their hunger. So for me, cooking was really just a hobby, uh, but I started voraciously reading about it, researching, mm -hmm. um, experimenting with all sorts of dishes, ingredients and techniques in the kitchen. And it was simultaneously that I uh, was experiencing the gradual vision loss at this time mm -hmm. in my 20s. So every time I would lose a little bit more vision due to the optic neuritis, I would have to reteach myself how to do simple uh, cooking things like using a knife again, or, or just how to deal with turning on my stove and, and understanding how high the fire goes. So that was just like reteaching myself over and over. Um, and then I decided to do a whole career change when I was going through this whole um, NMOSD situation in my 20s, because uh, I was working in corporate at the time, and then I had to take a very long leave of absence because I was dealing with the vision loss, dealing with the paralysis from the spinal cord inflammation, and uh, I had to leave the corporate job. And then I decided eventually, after I recovered fully from the spinal cord inflammation, but not the vision loss, I decided to go back to school for creative writing. And the reason I did that was because it was during this time that uh, I was listening to audiobooks. I had, you know, there was a, a time when I was pretty much completely blind because my optic neuritis was affecting both of my eyes. Uh, and I was paralyzed from the neck down because of the spinal cord inflammation. So I was pretty much laid up in bed, couldn't see anything. So the only thing that really helped me get through the, those rough times was listening to audiobooks mm -hmm. and that allowed me to rediscover my love for literature. Like I've grown up always loving to read books and storytelling. So then I decided after recovering, I, I wanted to go back to school and get a degree in creative writing. And then the master chef thing kind of happened um, 
just by chance. And it was uh, the auditions were happening. I had learned how to cook again in spite of the vision loss. And then I really went on the show um, or I auditioned for it thinking that I would have a funny story to write about when I'm in school. So I really went for just the experience, the life experience and the creativity that I could potentially unlock some interesting personal essay or something. So I didn't go expecting to get far and I didn't take the competition that seriously at the beginning, but I am a competitive person by nature. So as I was passing the challenges, I realized more and more that I, I wanted to win that title just to kind of prove not only to myself and to, but also to everyone else that I like cooking and winning a competition and competing can be done in spite of being diagnosed with NMOSD or having to deal with vision loss. And so I uh, ended up winning the third season. Um, and then that is what kind of launched the culinary side of my career and gave me many opportunities to write the cookbook and do more cooking television. And of course, eventually open a few restaurants in Houston. So um, everything has been, um, I don't know, an amazing ride, but I, I feel like the most important thing beyond everything that I've accomplished is being given this platform, I think, to make, mm. I think what both of you have said, is like, if we just make one person's life better, then it makes it all worth it. So for me, it's, I think, being able to use this sudden public platform that I've given um, to be very open about my NMOSD, my vision loss, and then to help someone else who perhaps is experiencing some sort of uh, disability or being diagnosed, newly diagnosed with NMOSD or an autoimmune condition to look to my story and, and find, I guess, hope, I think, in, in that they can still live to their full and true potential in spite of whatever challenges they have to deal with physically, mentally, and emotionally. Wow. Ladies, I mean, I am so inspired. So, I mean, I couldn't cook when I went to college, but I learned how to make like hot dogs and ramen noodles. Like I was not. <laughs> Missy, I, still can't, I still can't cook. At oh all. my gosh. <laughs> I know how to make like three or four things. And that's just so my children don't starve to death. I mean, that's it. Um, but um, we're coming to the end of our time, ladies. I know that went by really fast. So as we're coming to the end, listen, I am so inspired. And I hope that everyone else who is watching this is also inspired, you know, to know that despite a diagnosis of NMOSD, yeah. there's still purpose and you may find a new purpose and a new path in life despite um, this diagnosis. And so you guys, you know, it's just so amazing to hear you talk about your journeys. And I would like to know before we close, what advice would you give to someone who's newly diagnosed, someone who is, you know, just kind of grappling with their diagnosis, trying to figure out where their sense of community, where their tribe is, so to speak. What advice would you give to them as we get ready to end the show? <laughs> Whoever wants to go first. We'll start with Samira. <clears throat> okay. Um, there are times to cry and for sure you should, but right now you need to roll up your sleeves and be your own best advocate. That means asking questions, getting smart on your disease, knowing what options you have and, and doing it all while listening to your body and taking care of oneself. It's a tall order, but I do believe that there is somewhat of a recipe for <laughs> a lack of better words, but perfect for Christine, um, to living as wonderful as, of a life as you possibly can, which is make sure you have a doctor who knows and understands your disease. Make sure you get on a therapy that works for you. Um, have support, lean on your family, lean on your friends, don't ignore your feelings and get involved and advocate. We can all accomplish a lot if we put our minds together. Amazing. Christine? Uh, a lot of what Sumire said, I, I will say it's very important to be an educated patient, mm -hmm. to learn as much as you can about your disease and work with your healthcare team. It may not always be that the first healthcare provider you work with is the right one for you and that's okay. Mm -hmm. So find the right team that listens to you, 
that allows you to have a voice and a say in your treatment plan because everyone's individual NMOSD story and journey can be quite different. So that's important to have a voice. And also I think it, uh, for me, I remember when I was newly diagnosed, it was such a lonely situation because I didn't know anyone else. I'd never heard of the disease. Even my doctors had not heard of it. And so I think it's important to find a community and find other patients and caregivers that have heard of the disease are living it as well. And although everyone's symptoms and stories are different, the, the shared human emotions are often the same. Like we all go through that same sort of grieving process where first you're, you know, you're shocked and you're in denial of it. And then perhaps eventually, hopefully that leads to acceptance. Um, and so I think to find that community, to be an advocate for your own health care and to find the right resources uh, to help you figure out what the right treatment plan is for you is really important. So for example, the resources that you can find and all of this information can be found at nmosdwontstopme.com, which is has a plethora of resources to reach out to other patients and to read up about the disease and just find out as much as you can so that you are an educated uh, patient and advocate for yourself. Amazing. I couldn't have said it any better, ladies. And the last thing before we log off, tell everybody where to find you guys. Tell us how can we find you? Well, I'm on, I'm pretty active on my social media. So my handle on Instagram, um, Facebook, Twitter is uh, at the blind cook. So I try to do as much as I can on there. Life is pretty busy with uh, running these restaurants and doing all of these things. But um, yeah, I'm on social media. So you can always find out what I'm up to on at the blind cook. Perfect. And what about you, Samira? How can everybody follow you? We are, I slash we are also all over social media. I would say follow the foundation. I'm not that interesting. Um, so that's at the Samira Foundation on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook. And of course, please visit our website. It's www.samirafoundation.org. You can find uh, so much there, hopefully. And it's now available in 13 languages. <laughs> Sweet. Well, ladies, listen, this has been an amazing conversation. I am definitely inspired um, and just so grateful for all of the amazing work that you are doing and just for you guys standing in the space that you are in and just continuing to let your light shine so that everyone um, can know that they can live well with NMOSD. So um, thank you everyone uh, for tuning in tonight. We also want to thank our sponsors, uh, Horizon and Biogen IDEC for sponsoring tonight's episode. And I will see everyone in two weeks uh, for the next episode of Brain Chat with the Nerdy Neurologist. Thank you, ladies. Thank Bye. you, Dr. Williams. Thanks, Samira. See you both very soon. You got it. <laughs>